Hey everyone, welcome into the webinar. Hope you're excited to learn um, a little bit more about federal disability retirement today. Today we're going to be talking about uh, denials. What do those look like? They can be scary things, um, but hopefully you'll see th going through this webinar um, that you have options still, and uh, especially if you have representation like Harris Federal, uh, you have a lot of good options and, and uh, a lot of uh, successful outcomes that we've seen um, throughout our years of, of doing this. Um, today, you've got one of the best people uh, to talk to you about this, I think, um, and Leah bachmeyer Killy. She is our associate attorney here at Harris Federal Law Firm. She manages uh, almost all of our appeals here um, with our team. Um, and she, the, to me, there is no better person to hear from uh, about this. And I think you will hear her expertise as you go throughout this process. Um, we also have uh, Anna Barnes here. And Anna is our Director of Organizational Development, as well as a certified federal retirement consultant. And Anna has been doing this with Harris Federal for almost a decade. And uh, Anna is in charge of all of our training here at the office. So she works directly with all of our uh, consultation specialists, um, all of our case managers, the whole team, and making sure that everybody knows uh, everything there is to know about federal disability retirement. And, and we are really proud of uh, her work and um, our team's expertise uh, in this uh, subject. And uh, I think having these two, uh, I would consider powerhouses uh, with these benefits, talk to you today, um, I think is really special. And like I said, I think you're going you're gonna to see and hear um, all the knowledge that they have. And, and I'm excited for for you guys to hear from them. Um, we have a quick disclaimer here. Um, this, all this is saying is that what we're presenting today isn't legal advice. Um, we, uh, we have clients, uh, some that are on here, we're, we're glad that you're here. But today's uh, material is just for educational purposes. This is to help you um, understand your benefits and to make decisions um, uh, based on uh, having the best education you can on, on what your benefits look like. Um, but like I said, um, really excited uh, for Leah and Anna to talk to you today. So without further ado, guys, take it away. Thank you so much, Nick. Yes, my name is Leah Bachmeyer Killy. I'm the associate attorney. I'm so excited to be here with you guys today. And my name is Anna Barnes. I'm the director of organizational development here at Harris Federal Law Firm, and I am really excited to get into this, Leah. So um, today we're going to be covering um, reasons for denial. In this presentation, we'll cover the application timeline, reasons for a denial, medical documentation requirements, uh, reasonable accommodations, what happens if you get denied in the appeal process, as well as understanding all of those appeal options. Awesome. So first, we're going to just take a look at the application process for disability retirement. Um, the timeline varies quite a bit depending on an agency that you work for or OPM, but generally speaking, it takes about 30 to 90 days to build an application that's going to be approved for disability retirement. Um, at that point, it's going to be submitted to your agency if you're still on the rolls. And depending on the agency, again, it can take anywhere between one and four months before your application gets to the OPM. Um, OPM's decisions can vary greatly, but lately we've been seeing anywhere between 8 and 12 months. Yes, like Anna said, um, the application time can vary. Keep in mind the application prep is all, all the time dependent upon the documents that you might need to gather, like application forms, um, as well as medical documentation, or perhaps some uh, prep for documents at your agency that need to be completed before considering an application. Um, at the agency, like Anna said, one to four months. Uh, the guidelines published by OPM really recommend that an agency does things within 30 days, but that's quite unrealistic for federal agencies uh, considering the work that needs to be done. A very good agency can do it in 30 days, but I think for the most part, anywhere between one to four months is still very, very typical. So what happens, let's say, if you go through this whole process and the medical specialist OPM denies your claim? 
Well, what's going to happen is that medical specialist is going to write an initial decision letter. They're going to date it, have your CSA number, and you'll get it by certified mail typically. Um, and they can vary in length. Some are like four pages. Others I've seen get up to 20 pages. But it's going to outline the requirements for disability retirement and then go through your particular application and give reasons for a denial. Great. Thank you, Leah. So let's look at some of the more common reasons for denials that we see typically. Um, the, the first one that we see a lot of is issues with various forms. And so we're going to talk about the SF3112A first. This is the Applicant Statement of Disability form. Um, Leah, tell us a little bit about the 3112A and, and what it is and why we need it. Yes, so the 3112A kind of lays out your statement of disability, uh, what your medical conditions are, how they interfere with your ability to engage in your particular federal position's essential job duties, um, as well as how it affects you at home. You also need to list a date of disability, um, if you've been accommodated or not by your agency. Um, it's a two-page form, but typically speaking, you may need to add a third page just because the spaces underneath uh, the areas to fill out can be a little short. And if you really want to get into your diagnoses and the reasons um, you're disabled, a lot of times we recommend having a longer statement than just the form itself. Um, this form is extremely crucial, um, and there's lots of things on it that can go wrong. So for example, maybe you don't list all of your diagnosed conditions. It can be very hard or impossible to add conditions later on, depending on what stage of appeal you're at. Um, another common one is the disability date. You are supposed to approximate the date you became disabled. Um, an important note to that is if you were separated, be sure that your disability date is before your separation. Otherwise, you're alleging you didn't become disabled until after you left your job, uh, which will not let you qualify for disability retirement. We typically recommend separated employees pick a date at least several months before their uh, separation um, just so that they can establish the timeline of realizing they had a diagnosis, having difficulties at work, and then being separated um, either by the agency or through resignation. Um, Anna, anything to add to that? Uh, no, I think that that covers the 3112A. Um, another part of the 3112 as a whole is going to be uh, the 3112C, which covers your medical documentation. And the form itself is a little misleading because you just sign it, you put an address on there, and it does outline what's expected for medical documentation, but it's not super clear. Um, so we do see a lot of issues with OPM denying claims based on a lack of objective medical evidence or doctor's support. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So like you said, the form itself, you just sign and submit. Um, and a lot of people think, oh, OPM will get me my medical documentation similar to Social Security. That is not the case. You are supposed to submit medical documentation. And even the form itself, I don't think quite says what OPM is looking for because it asks for a physician statement. So, you know, maybe a letter from your doctor addressing the things listed on the 3112C. But in reality, OPM expects you to submit medical records to accompany medical statements. So you're not usually going to get away with just a medical statement. It's going to have to include more. And it's going to show that, you know, you have a diagnosed medical condition that's interfering with some of your ability to work. This may be stated explicitly, um, or maybe it's kind of, you know, unwritten, but it talks about the difficulties you have generally. Um, you also need to have a prognosis of a medical condition lasting at least 12 months from the date of your application. So that's not the date you were diagnosed, that's the date that you submitted your application. So there are a lot of little things that can go wrong as far as wording and medical documentation. Um, and that, you know, can lead to a denial that will need to be corrected in the appeal phase. Yes. And, uh, you know, beyond just the medical records, we talked a little bit about a statement from your doctor. Um, and OPM is really specific in the types of things they want to see in one of those statements or narratives. Um, can you just give us a couple of things they're looking for on those narratives specifically? Uh, so ideally, OPM is looking for records as well as a separate letter from your doctor, ideally on physician letterhead. 
Um, although I've seen them, you know, successfully take and approve people if, you know, your attorney like our firm does some things on our letterhead, but it would need a signature from the doctor um, and need to kind of line up with the medical records that are provided. And like I mentioned before, it really needs to get into your diagnoses, your your prognosis, as well as, you know, describe what you've been doing as far as treatment goes. Uh, disability retirement does require that you are compliant with reasonably prescribed medical treatment. So there needs to be information information about, you know, what treatment is available, what treatment you've been doing, um, and confirming that you've been compliant. Um, and that includes, you know, not having gaps in your, your treatment, you know, taking your medication, um, going to therapy and doctor's appointments. There are things that you're permitted to, you know, not engage in, um, but those are very specific exceptions. Uh, thanks, Leah. Those are all really great points um, when talking about your medical support. Now, aside from medical documentation and doctor support, there are some other pieces of the 3112 that your agency has to be engaged in. Most specifically, uh, the 3112D, which is the Agency Certification of Reassignment and Accommodation Efforts. Um, OPM has really specific requirements about what you have done as far as reasonable accommodation requests go and what your agency has done. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about how that might work? Yeah, so typically speaking, that form does need to be filled out, and it's it's a very generic form. It permits agencies to kind of just click boxes on whether or not um, you've gone through accommodation and the results of that to also include the accommodation of last resort, which is reassignment. We see a lot of times that those forms can be completed very badly where it says, you know, no accommodation request received and reassignment's not necessary, employees performing, you know, job duties. And it can be very frustrating to people a lot of times because that form can be filled out inaccurately. Um, a lot of HR uh, specialists that aren't necessarily even at your local agency end up filling out this form. And they're just looking in your personnel file for, you know, accommodation requests that were formal. It doesn't necessarily address if you've done informal accommodation requests, or maybe you just talked with your supervisor and he told you, yeah, we can't accommodate you. Um, so preparing for that form, um, is really a good idea. Um, and if you hadn't prepared for that form or maybe you did prepare and it just got filled out badly, um, throughout the appeal process, you can hopefully get some updates to overcome that. Um, now keep in mind, if you have been separated, that doesn't alleviate the need for this form. The OPM will still request this form from your past employing agency. So if you have been separated, it's a good idea to go ahead and start thinking about gathering documentation, maybe showing a history uh, you know, of your reasonable accommodation request prior to your separation, um, including you know, requests for reassignment or things like that, um, because we see a lot with separated employees that uh, a lot of errors can occur with the completion of that 3112D simply because maybe they don't remember you that well and they're just going on your personnel file if they still have it since personnel files can often be forwarded to the National Personnel Records Center after a certain amount of time. And that kind of leads into our next reason, which is just general agency unfamiliarity with the disability retirement process and and what OPM's rules are and expectations are regarding an approval for the benefit. So we're going to talk again about the, the supervisor's statement and then the accommodation form a little bit, um, specifically when and how you should discuss with your agency that you are struggling with your work and your medical conditions are causing that. Yeah, so we see a lot of times with denials, um, people that hire us at denial level especially, is they weren't necessarily um, disclosing a lot of things to their agency. Maybe they wanted to keep things private and didn't feel that you're, you know, the agency should know about things. Unfortunately, because of the B and D forms being required, um, on the 3112, it's really actually a much better idea to be transparent with your agency um, and try to get them familiar with the process of disability retirement. Um, simply because if your agency doesn't know about your conditions, they can really hurt you in filling out the forms incorrectly. So for example, if the person who fills out your supervisor statement, you haven't disclosed that you've been struggling um, due to a medical condition, they may fill out that form very, very unsupportively and that can impact your disability retirement. It's a lot easier to receive forms out uh, forms filled out correctly when you've discussed your medical conditions with the person that's going to be filling out the supervisor statement. If you've gone through maybe a more formal 
formal accommodation process so that HR has that request on record, things like that. And again, these are required forms. So if your supervisor is saying, hey, I don't have to fill out that form, maybe they're just unfamiliar with the disability retirement process. These forms are required. Um, by OPM. Um, you need to submit them with your application. If they don't get submitted with it, OPM will request them. If o OPM is unsuccessful in getting them, then a judge at the board level is still going to want them. So you can't get around the absence of forms a lot of times. Yeah, and, and it's important to note too that some people are really anxious to discuss this with their agency, but your agency will have to participate in this process along the way. So uh, the sooner you can start discussing it with them, the easier this process will be for you. Um, so that goes for both the SF3112B and D. Um, one really important point regarding the D is the agency's understanding of what an accommodation is versus what OPM is looking for as far as accommodations go. Could you explain the difference a little bit to us? Yes. So under the ADA, an accommodation is, you know, something that allows you to permit your, you know, job with or without accommodations, you know, if you've got a medical condition. Um, an accommodation specifically has to permit you to perform the essential functions of your position, right? So giving you light duty assignments, taking away certain aspects of your job that are essential to your job, um, or reassigning you informally, none of those are going to be a true accommodation for disability retirement purposes. And the law on this is really clear under a famous case called Bracey versus OPM that we end up having to cite to a lot. Um, going through the accommodation process is really important um, because it allows us to, you know, build the case that you've requested accommodation, maybe you've been denied, um, and we need to flesh out the reasons for that denial and how you don't meet the, you know, requirements uh, for a, an accommodation under the ADA. Um, again, this is important to go through the accommodation process prior to separation. Once you've been separated, you can't really go back and ask for accommodation when you've been separated for, you know, three months. Your agency's not going to remember you sometimes. Um, and they're certainly not going to want to fill out paperwork contemplating what accommodation would have been possible prior to your separation. That's exactly right, Lee. I know we've run into that a handful of times, and it just makes it significantly more difficult to prove that you your agency could not accommodate you. Yes. Harder, but not impossible. So even if you've gotten bad agency forms in a denial, you know, keep in mind there are ways to overcome those issues. So that kind of goes through the reasons for denial, but what about actually taking action if you are denied? So if you are denied, you've got appeal rights. Um, if you go through an initial denial, you're going to have um, a first appeal right as well as a second appeal right and actually further appeal rights past that, but we're really just gonna focus on the next two appeal stages. The first appeal is called reconsideration. Um, it takes an average of about four to six months to go through. Again, that's an average. Some cases take a bit longer. Some cases are a bit shorter. The second stage is called the Merit Systems Protection Board Initial Appeal. Um, and on average, it, also, it can take about six to eight months. Again, some cases a bit shorter than that, some cases a bit longer than that. So looking at the uh, process a little more closely, Anna, can you fill us in? Yeah, absolutely. So when you are applying for disability retirement, you're going to start with your initial application. Um, an OPM will review that and a medical specialist is going to make that decision. Um, most of our clients are approved at the initial stage. But if you are denied, you can go to the next level, which is the reconsideration level. This still takes place at OPM. Uh, your claim will be assigned a new medical specialist and you'll have an additional 30 days to submit an appeal. Um, you can request additional time to send in further supporting documentation, uh, or if you feel that OPM made a mistake, you can have them reissue a decision based on what they have. It's generally in your best interest to not do that. You should usually submit additional documentation if you have been denied. Um, once you go through the reconsideration process and submit your appeal, OPM could at this point deny you again, uh, at which point you will have rights to an MSPB appeal. And this takes place outside of OPM. This is not within the OPM anymore. Um, and this is Leah's real specialty, is, is handling claims at the MSPB. Um, so why don't you give us just kind of a little rundown of what MSPB is and, and how it works in relation to disability retirement? 
Yeah, so the Merit Systems Protection Board is a quasi-judicial administrative agency. It was created to protect the merit principles of federal employment. Um, They hear a hodgepodge of uh, cases, but one of their original jurisdiction cases is retirement cases, any retirement case. So disability retirement also falls under that. Um, The Merit Systems Protection Board has a number of regional offices throughout the United States. You can Google MSPB regional offices. Uh, You file to whichever one is closest to your physical location, um, but you're never actually going to travel there. Things done uh, at the MSPB are now electronic as well as telephonic or Zoom conferences and have been actually prior uh, to the pandemic. Um, You do need to file the Merit Systems Protection Board appeal within 30 days of your receipt of the denial letter. Um, ideally, you actually want to file within 30 days of the date of the denial letter, just because proving that you received it, you know, a little later on from that with a postmark date can be a bit cumbersome. Um, so it's better to just be safe rather than sorry. When you file your appeal, it goes to that regional office and the MSPB will assign um, an administrative legal judge to your case who will ultimately hear your case in a telephonic or video conference hearing. Um, But it's not just you participating. You can have medical providers or family and friends or coworkers or supervisors participate in the hearing. Um, And the OPM also participates. They have legal specialists out of an appeals office in Washington, D.C. that uh, participate in these hearings and in these appeals and represent the OPM's um, decision, which can also be changed during this, you know, time period by the legal specialist. Um, But ultimately, they'll participate in your case. Now, keep in mind, if you lost, you know, at MSPB or maybe you didn't appeal in time, you still have the ability to reapply after these denials as long as you are still employed by the federal agency. Um, You will need to show a change in circumstance. Um, This can be the worsening of a medical condition, um, something changed at your work, maybe an accommodation was taken away, um, or maybe a medical condition has, you know, newly arisen, something has changed. But keep in mind, you know, you can still reapply as long as you're still federally employed. Now, if you were separated, your one application is all you've got to go on. Thank you, Leah. Uh, So... If you're denied an MSPB, uh, aside from starting all over from the beginning, if you've had a change in circumstance, I know there are a couple of further appeal options that exist. Um, Talk to us a little bit about the full MSPB in Washington, D.C. Yes, so you can submit what's called a petition for review to the full board in Washington, D.C. Um, It is extremely backlogged, so uh, we don't have a specific time frame Uh, They didn't have a full quorum of judges, so realistically, it's probably going to take a number of years for them to work through the backlog and get to your case. Um, But the panel is three judges that would review uh, the written file. They only reverse, you know, if you meet certain criteria within a petition for review. It's not like you get to tell your story all over again. You really need to prove that something went, you know, wrong with the judge's initial decision. You know, maybe they uh, were basing their decision on an incorrect material fact or something like that. Um, You can also request to have your case taken to the U.S. Court of Appeals uh, for the Federal Circuit to make a decision on your case. Um, That specific court is very strict as far as uh, filings, when to file things, how they need to look. Um, So be aware that it's significantly stricter than the Merit Systems Protection Board, which is, you know, an administrative agency at its heart and is much more lenient um, on filings. The the Federal Circuit is, is a lot harder on folks. So most of the time, we don't recommend going through that appeals process. If, if at all possible, if you can make a new application, that's a much better option. That is some great information, Leah. And, you know, it sounds like this can be a complicated process, which is why it's really important to get some professional guidance from the very beginning. Um, if you start off with a really strong application, then your chances at the initial level and this, the following appeals is, is much higher. Um, so we really, really recommend uh, getting some assistance as early on in the process as possible. Yes, that's absolutely correct. Um, It's really heartbreaking to get phone calls from folks that maybe have, you know, gotten an initial denial and maybe didn't do the best job at, you know, with agency documentation or maybe with medical documentation. It makes the appeal process a lot harder and can be extra stressful because you've already got this bad documentation on file. 
Um, typically speaking, when you have help from the initial stage, it's a lot easier to control the documentation. So if something does go wrong, like in an agency form, um, your representative can be prepared um, and see in the file what can already be used to overcome it. Yeah, and I'd also like to point out that once something has been submitted for your disability retirement application, it cannot be unsubmitted. So um, anything that gets submitted at the initial level by yourself or somebody assisting you with that process is is in your application for the duration of the process. Um, so nothing can be taken back if it was submitted erroneously. That's correct. And keep in mind that's true even if you do a new application that... OPM would still have your original application, and if it's done close in time especially, they're going to be really looking at it to see, you know, why you did an, a new application. Yeah, so with all of that being said, uh, you know, Harris Federal is here specifically to help federal employees through this process. It's, it's a maze of forms and rules and requirements, but we have years and years of experience handling these types of claims. Um, Leah specifically has been handling the, these disability retirement claims for almost 10 years now. Um, so, you know, don't don't risk it alone. We're, we're here to help you with it. Yes, and we have a 99% success rate. Um, a lot of times we're able to give a 100% money back promise. Um, and we have over 6,000 happy clients. Uh, you can read some of our Google reviews or Facebook reviews or look around on our website for client testimonials. Um, we really pride ourselves in helping people um, when they need to retire due to a disability. Yep, that's exactly right. Uh, so just to kind of recap what we've gone over, um, it's important to know that the application process for disability retirement can be lengthy. Um, it is really important to make sure you get all of the required documents together. Uh, deadlines are critical. OPM does not look kindly on missed deadlines. Uh, if you are denied, you do have appeal options. And, and mostly, and most importantly, we're here to help you through this process. Anna's absolutely right. And we're still here to actually answer your questions. Um, feel free to, you know, get into our chat and send us some questions. Uh, hopefully we can give you some answers or potentially set you up for a free phone consultation. All right, Leah, thank you so much. As always, it is a pleasure doing these with you. Of course, Anna, I love doing these with you. And for uh, our audience, please take care and have a wonderful day. Hey, thanks, Leah and Anna. Um, that was a ton of information. I'm sure you've got lots of uh, thoughts stirring in your mind, questions uh, that you want to be answered. Um, hopefully that took some of the fear of an initial denial away um, and showed you what your options are, that there's still hope, um, and, and how we can help you through that. Also, just a reminder, um, like I mentioned before, if you're watching this on YouTube uh, after the fact that this webinar has happened, um, don't worry, you can leave your questions in the comment section and we'd be happy uh, to answer those, our team gets to them um, pretty quickly. So uh, leave those there, and um, we'll try to help you walk through some of those questions and, uh, and hopefully get to talk to you about it more.